my name's Peter Taylor. I'm at the University of Melbourne. I'm the director of ASIMS, and I'm going to be the chair of this public lecture today. Uh, before we get started, I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I live and work, which is the Wurundjeri people from the Kulin Nation, who have been custodians of the land around Melbourne for a very long time. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and emerging. And I also pay my respects to Aboriginal um, and Torres Strait Islander peoples who may be online today. So it's my pleasure to have you all here. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rachel Quill, who will be giving us a talk on the title of A Song of Wind and Fire, Statistical Journey Through an Uncertain World. I did wonder whether we would have a whole bunch of Game of Thrones enthusiasts logging into this lecture. Maybe we have. And welcome if you are, because I'm sure you'll, it'll be good. So Rachel um, did her PhD at the University of New South Wales at ADFA in Canberra. And um, then went to the University of Adelaide. She's a, an ASEMS Associate Investigator, um, most recently moved to the University of Melbourne, and now very recently has um, moved to industry and she's working for WeatherZone. Um, so she's, uh, she's had a little bit of an interesting um, and varied career up to now. Um, she's been a major contributor to ASEMS um, up until the time she moved to WeatherZone. She was the chair of our equity and diversity committee. She's one of the, um, of, I guess I'll, I'll call Rachel Young. She's a very young person who's made an amazing contribution to ASEMS and it's, she's one of the people we're very proud of. So it's my absolute pleasure to, to welcome Rachel to give us the public lecture today. Um, thanks, Rachel. Thank you very much, Peter. That's a very nice introduction. It's always nice to hear these um, things. Um, yeah, so thank you and welcome to everyone online. Um, thank you for logging in today. Um, I would also like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the land on which I um, also live and work on, um, which is the, also the Wurundjeri people. Um, I want to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And, and I particularly in relation to what I might talk a little bit about today is I want to acknowledge their continuing and enduring connection to country um, and the lessons that we can learn from that connection um, throughout the past and into the future as well. So as Peter said, I, I'm a newly transitioned to WeatherZone as a forecast system developer. I am a statistician um, by trade and at heart. Um, and much of the content and work that I will talk to you about today comes from work and conversations with colleagues, friends, um, supervisors um, and so on throughout um, from UNSW Canberra where I did my PhD, um, the University of Adelaide and the University of Melbourne most recently as well. And a quick note on the title um, for those Game of Thrones enthusiasts in the audience, I'm afraid you have been drawn in by clickbait. Um, there are very minimal references to the books and or TV series. Um, so um, if we were in a lecture theatre, I would quietly allow those who are here for the Game of Thrones references to just walk out disappointed, if you like. Um, but hopefully most of you are actually here for perhaps the more relevant second part of the title, A Statistical Journey Through Our Uncertain World. So um, given that I've just recently joined a weather agency, I thought I would have a quick look at the weather forecast um, today. And, and think about it in the context of how we in how um, we work and deal with uncertainty and interact with uncertainty on a daily basis as individuals. So um, I am in Melbourne, and as you can see, nicely wrapped up, nice and warm, and inside. Um, I wondered how I wanted to wonder how many people, particularly across the south of Australia, um, have um, made sure they took their umbrellas this morning if they. Um, left the house or if they were allowed when for their one hour of exercise for those of you in Sydney or you perhaps gave up on the umbrella and took the coat because it's um, perhaps a little bit too windy um, and in particular um, the decisions that we might make over the next week or so in relation to that weather forecast and the particular storm system that's coming across southern Australia um, as we're making those decisions about what we wear how we might travel whether or not we leave the house or not um, <clears throat> we're absorbing and processing huge amounts of information. We're pulling in data from all of our different senses, how we might feel, um, what we can see out of the window. 
and and perhaps we do check our, our devices, our maybe even the Weather Zone app or the website. Um, and I promise that'll be the last time I mention that today. Um, our brains are pulling in all of that information. They're pulling it all together to make an informed decision. And much of that informed decision is made subconsciously and some of it is made consciously. But throughout that, there are layers of uncertainty around all of those pieces of information we're incorporating. Now, being unprepared for some of the unknown or the uncertainty um, might, in many cases, only mean a small dampening of our pride. If we get caught in that shower, um, we might just get it a little bit wet. Um, but under, under other circumstances, the consequences of not understanding and dealing with the uncertainty around those decisions can um, heighten. Um, for example, I had to give my umbrella to my small children this morning on our way to childcare because the consequences of them having a cold are far greater than the consequences of me having a cold. Um, and then we can progress that to something even more significant. So we're looking at this storm system moving across that's prolonged, significant storm conditions. Um, and so we need to make more complex, more um, consequential decisions around um, ensuring our homes, our businesses and so on are protected. And then we progress to even more complex, larger scale systems um, that have kind of national and global consequence and that some of those ideas that we'll talk about today and um, when the cost of not understanding uncertainty can progress to something pretty catastrophic. Um, I want to um, think about the around these decisions. I want to think about how we make decisions that are backed by science. And so in, in my personal opinion as a statistician over the last 12 and 18 months, we have seen some fantastic displays of decision making based on scientific evidence. And we've seen the scientific evidence and the decision making based on that brought to the front, brought to the fore in terms of um, public communication in those areas. Um, but in some circumstances, um, we've seen um, that it, the, this tagline being backed by science has been taken to that level of where sci it's kind of shown or assumed that perhaps science has given us a one single correct answer um, to our decision. Um, and therefore, we can take that single answer, make our decision and move forward. And so um, perhaps in the last week or so, or particularly when I was writing these slides a couple of weeks ago, um, then we've actually seen in the last few weeks that perhaps that's not entirely true. Perhaps our assumption that backed by science means we're making the right decision and there is only one decision to be made um, is not necessarily um, the case. Behind all of the science um, and understanding behind these decisions, there lies a huge amount of, a huge amount of uncertainty. And I would argue that in fact, um, science cannot always, if not very rarely, if ever, gives us one single certain solution to a problem. And so for those of you who came into the lecture today, assuming that mathematics tells us that things like one plus one equals two, um, what I want to tell you, particularly from a stat statistician's perspective, um, and dealing with this with the real world decisions, if you like, is that actually we're dealing with a value of around one added to a value of approximately one, and that equals two-ish, give or take a little bit. There is uncertainty around all of the components of the, that equation and all of the um, and the solutions that we might get from that. And so um, I I'm not a COVID researcher. I I simply um, am a um, oh, sorry. I'm um, a um, consumer of the statistics and so on um, in the public realm. So I want to move away from this um, perhaps controversial um, and particular state of the world um, in from the medical and um, health perspective. And I want to move on to a somewhat different but perhaps um, equally as catastrophic global uh, challenge, if you like. Um, that is climate change. And in fact, I'm not going to talk about climate change specifically. I'm just going to use it as um, as context for the fields that I want to talk about a bit more specifically today. Um, so under climate change and, and despite or on top of the challenges of a global pandemic, we're faced with a multitude of, of challenges and decisions um, in multiple different areas, be they environmental or social or economic and so on. 
And among all those challenges and the science that underpins the decisions we need to make moving forward, there lies layers and layers of complexity that are laced with layers of uncertainty. And so in particular, what I want to talk to you about today are these two kind of aspects of the problem. Um, on the left hand side here, we've got a map of the change in dangerous fire weather days across Australia um, from the last 30 years compared to the 30 years prior to that. Um, so this is from the State of the Climate Report in 2020. And we can see a pretty broad increase in um, the number of dangerous weather days across the country. Um, which poses significant challenges as we're moving forward in relation to um, predicting bushfire behaviour, um, managing the risks around bushfires, and then managing the real-time um, um, response to um, bushfires in our, across our country. And, and the kind of flip side and another component of addressing these global challenges of climate change are uh, um, in um, the significant increase in generation from and of electricity generation from renewable resources. So this is a graph showing that increase from renewable resources over the last um, 30 years. And in particular, we can see over the last 10 years or so, we've seen a massive boom in wind and solar generation across Australia. And so I want to um, kind of bring these two examples of different areas um, that, of global challenges that we're facing um, across today and think about how uncertainty is built, um, how, how the layers of uncertainty fit within those contexts and how we can pull apart and understand um, where, the, where the uncertainty lies. So this is um, a very small reference to um, Game of Thrones. So we'll start from this assumption that we know nothing OK, um, and what I want to, to go through is actually the reality is we do know some things and there are a lot of things we do know. And, we, and, and you know, there's wonderful science going on so that we know more and more every day. Um, but there is also a huge amount of um, things that we do not know and how um, and they contribute to uncertainty around our decisions that we're making on, across these various problems. And so the first part of my talk today, I want to introduce a con um, some concepts and tools that we can use to really break down the ideas of uncertainty in our decision making process. And then the second and third part of the talk, um, I'm going to go back to these kind of applied areas and think about how we can apply those tools once we've got this kind of conceptual general tools of understanding uncertainty, how can we apply that to predicting bushfire and make progress in those spaces and how can we apply that to forecasting wind energy and make progress in that space. So um, I'm going to start, as um, any good st statistics lecturer will start with, is, is a problem based on rolling of the dice. And so many of you may be having flashbacks, horrible flashbacks, to um, the te your, your statistics lectures or your statistics classes at school and think, oh, my goodness, why do I have to learn how to roll dice? Well, what relevance is this to my life? And so um, I'm now, <laughs> what I want to tell you is that the reason uh, your statistics teachers break things down to somewhat trivial and perhaps non-unrealistic um, scenarios and um, problems is that we want to get rid of all the messiness. We want to get rid of the noise and get rid of as much of the uncertainty around a problem as we can so that we can break things down to the fundamental components of that concept. And so what I'm going to try and introduce to you today is a, is a general conceptual framework for understanding uncertainty in any problem. And so we'll start off with the most simplest and trivial of problems, such as rolling a dice. Um, and we're going to think about this framework of understanding uncertainty with these three questions. So where does the uncertainty arise in the process? How does the uncertainty arise in the process? and how much uncertainty is contributed um, from our understanding. And, um, and we can frame that in terms of our understanding of the process. Um, and so let's take the simplest of problems. We have a dice, we're going to roll it. We want to guess the value on the upward facing face once we've rolled the dice. So if we think about where does the uncertainty arise in that process? So we've got hold of our dice, we're going to roll it, and then our dice lands and, we choose, and, want, and we're guessing a number, right? And we're either right or wrong. And so the uncertainty arises in the physical roll of that dice. 
<clears throat> once the dice has left a hand, it's gone across the table, across the floor, or if you're my child, some other side of the other room. Um, the uncertainty is in that in that process of the role. And so how that uncertainty arises is inherent to the rolling of the dice. It's kind of inherent to the process. It's a natural variation um, in the system. Okay. And so if we jump to our traditional idea of what we think about this problem, we're going to guess, okay, well, there's a one in six chance of any number, um, any one of the numbers from one to six coming up. So we'll guess any number. And we know the uncertainty around that because we know there's a one in six chance of it being any of those numbers. Okay. But then if we think about this framework and we, we, um, and we kind of um, abstract a little bit more, aside from the very suggestive picture that I've put on the slide, I actually, we haven't actually defined the number of sides of our dice. What, what is the shape of our dice? And, and in fact, what are the labels on the dice? Um, it, are they numbers? Are they letters? Perhaps they're yoga positions and so on. So um, then if we think about actually we haven't got that information in our initially defined process, um, the uncertainty around our guess um, increases many, many fold. Um, and so, but what this, um, and, and if we think about how that uncertainty arises, that uncertainty has arisen due to our lack of knowledge of the system. And so this is where we think about this um, general process and this general um, framework for understanding uncertainty. And we can see where it's instantly guided us to a place where we can ask more questions. Um, we have our process. We've asked these questions about, okay, where is uncertainty in this process? And we've gone, we don't know, we don't have enough information about the shape of our dice, the labels on the dice in order to make an informed decision about what our guess will be. Um, and so we can fit this into a framework. Okay, so we start to think about we've got um, where has the uncertainty arisen? So we can think about that as the source of the uncertainty in our in our problem. And so we've talked about the role of the dice itself and the and then the shape and the labels of the dice. Um, how does that uncertainty arise? And so in these two different um, sources, we've got very different, um, the, the nature of the uncertainty, the characteristics of the uncertainty are very different. In the role of the dice, the uncertainty was a natural variation. It was intrinsic to the process of rolling a dice. In the shape of the dice, in the labelling of the dice, um, the, the uncertainty was due to a natural lack of our knowledge of the system. So that's extrinsic to the rolling of the dice. It's external. Um, um, it's due to a lack of our knowledge. It's where we can simply ask more questions and reduce that uncertainty. And then we can label the, the level, the uncertainty around that we have around this system and in terms of a level. Okay, so our classic, um, so before we had even thought about the shape and the labels of the dice, perhaps the uncertainty was actually a complete unknown unknown. Um, and, and the uncertainty was far greater than we had thought about. Once we had identified that we maybe needed to ask a question about the shapes and labels, it became a known unknown. We still, there was still a level of unknown about what the labels and shapes could possibly be. Um, and so we couldn't put a figure on it yet, but at least we knew that there was a level of uncertainty there. Once we can narrow down, okay, we've got a six-sided dice and we've got numbers or dots on it, then we can reduce it to, okay, so it's a, um, there's a one in six chance of any particular value. Um, and we still have, and we reduce and remove that uncertainty that comes from the shape and label and the lack of knowledge. Um, and we're left with the kind of natural, um, fair um, rolling of a dice. If we perhaps remove the fair rolling of the dice, we ask more questions and think about the lack of knowledge about the roll itself. Um, perhaps we're not really rolling the dice, we're just putting the dice down on the table, at which point we know what the answer would be. If we're always going to roll our dice, to put the dice down on the table with a one facing up, then we have a certain answer. Um, we have a definite guess that we would always guess if that's what we determined the roll would always be. And so we can see we can use this framework to break down even the most simplest and trivial of examples down to this idea of where the uncertainty is coming from, how the uncertainty is um, constructed, and then we can assign some sort of level of uncertainty around um, each of those layers and the, and the whole process in and of itself. 
And so then, as we as I talked about in statistics, we can build this up to uh, we build up this framework to systems that are more and more complex, and we can make this framework far more general. And so we're going to jump from rolling of a dice. We can maybe go up through, okay, so how do we make decisions about whether or not we're taking an umbrella with us today? Um, what are the sources of uncertainty in that? What is the nature of uncertainty around those sources? And then what is our level of uncertainty in those, um, in those layers? And we, have, we end up with this general framework. Um, I'll talk about the breakdown of the sources of uncertainty in a, in a little bit in in relation to bushfire. Um, but in the nature of the uncertainty, we've really got these two ideas. The first is um, we see that it's extrinsic or it's due to a lack of knowledge about the process. Um, or we've got this intrinsic uncertainty, which is due to a kind of natural variation within the process itself. And we can assign our level of uncertainty across this spectrum from a complete unknown unknown um, through to a certain. Um, and the, the range in between there is where our practical uncertainty lies. When we, we can go from a known unknown through to some kind of statistical level of uncertainty that we can, to, we can quantify with a specific number. So what I want to do is think, is think about how this framework applies in scenarios such as in bushfire prediction, for example. So I'm going to change pace um, a little bit. So here in, in 2003, um, fires burnt across um, southeastern Australia um, in multiple different areas. Um, and in one particular region to the west of Canberra, um, fires began in early January um, in the Brindabella Ranges. Now, these fires burnt um, throughout the ranges for a few days, um, if not weeks. And then on the 18th of January, um, there was a significant step change in the, in the fire behaviour um, for various reasons. Um, and that fire burned into the suburbs of Canberra, destroying 500 homes and, and sadly taking four lives. So I use this fire as, um, as, as a particular example. There are obviously multiple examples of fire spread and, and significant fire behaviour and loss of life and loss of property across Australia um, over many, many years. It is a very natural, it, it can be a very natural component of the Australian landscape. Um, but in the 2003 fires, there was observed um, some atypical behaviour um, of, these fire, uh, of these fires that didn't fit with the modelling that we had, the, the state of the art modelling and understanding we had about fire spread at the time. Um, and so in particular around the, the ranges, we can see the mountainous terrain um, to the west of Canberra, there was spotted this atypical behaviour um, where fire started to spread in what, what was very unpredictable kind of way. And in the nearly 20 years since those fires, um, there's been a huge amount of work to understand these different behaviours and to improve our understanding of predicting bushfires. And so I want to think about the idea of predicting bushfires in this um, today in the context of understanding uncertainty within that system. And so this is an extraordinarily simplified um, scheme a schematic of, of how we predict bushfires in an operational context. There are many, many more components to incorporate in here. And if we imagine all of these components that we've got here with individual lines crossing, circulating, going back and forth and around, you might start to have an idea of how complex modelling a bushfire um, and the behaviour of a bushfire might be and predicting how that spreads and therefore how we might respond to it. But we can break it down into a couple of different um, sections so that we can think about our uncertainty framework and the sources of uncertainty within this system. So we've got a whole bunch of inputs. Um, so we've got some kind of fire behaviour inputs where we've got the weather, the topography, the fuel load on the ground. And then we've got some external influences, which might be the ignition. Um, we've also got particular assets that we might want to, that we're particularly interested in protecting the response of, of fire agencies, emergency services to the fire itself. 
Um, and we put all of those components, all of those inputs into a variety of different models. And so there are multiple sub models interlinked to um, other models in this process that generate a fire behavior prediction. And that even in that fire behavior prediction, we're, produ we're producing multiple different outputs. So we have the rate of spread of that fire, um, the perimeter that we might expect that fire to be in an hour's time, the characteristics about that fire, how intense are they, how high are the flames, um, what, what kind of spotting distances might we be looking towards and so on. <laughs> and also that um, in over a longer period of time, we're looking at the fire danger rating. And so we see, um, you see those warnings put out on the roads, on the news and so on about your fire danger rating. All of these components of these models and inputs go into those, um, into those ratings. And then with all of that information, we need to make decisions. And so we, as, as the public, make decisions about what we might do on particular days of fire danger rating, or if we're in an unfortunate position to be a threat of a bushfire, the decisions that we need to make about protecting our home um, and so on. And some and and we take information from all sorts of different sources and in particular from the operations controllers, um, the fire behavior analysts that are working within our emergency services um, to to absorb all of this information, put it all together and, and put forward decisions um, towards how we respond to a fire, whether or not we we need to evacuate towns and so on. Okay. And so what um what we can do is apply our framework of understanding uncertainty in this system so that we can understand where the kind of um, where the slightly grayer bits of our knowledge might be. Where is the uncertainty coming from um, when we have these outcomes, when we're trying to make decisions in, in sometimes very high stress situations, right? Um, we, we, we need to make a yes, no decision um, about whether or not we evacuate a town, whether or not we leave our home um, and so on. Um, but the information we have behind that decision comes with all of these different layers of uncertainty. And so what we want to do is try and understand the uncertainty throughout the system that builds into that um, information um, so that we can better characterize what that information is around backing our decision. And something I want to, to really point out here and that really covers across all of the, um, what I'm talking about today is that understanding the uncertainty in this process um, does not like there is no driver here to try and change the decision at the end. Um, the aim is not necessarily to change the decision. We may end up still evacuating a town or we may end up still leaving our home or, um, or staying and defending. Um, we might have we may end up with the same result in terms of the decision that we make, but we are armed with more information. We know more about the potential consequences of saying yes or no, or no or go, or no go. Um, and, and perhaps we even by understanding the uncertainty and the range of possible outcomes, we perhaps come up with an alternative to our original yes, no choice. And so all of this characterization of uncertainty is about creating more information behind um, these, these, dis these decisions. So in terms of our bushfire prediction um, modeling system, we can think about the sources of uncertainty in that um, <clears throat> as we had um, previously. And so the conceptual source of uncertainty around a modeling system, and this applies to not just um, fire prediction, but in lots of different modeling um, circumstances, much of this work has been developed from an environmental modeling perspective, but it can apply to lots of different areas. That conceptual idea of the modeling framework is essentially around how we design the model, the paradigm under which we're designing a model, the way we think about how fire spreads through the landscape. Um, and that comes with levels of uncertainty around it. Um, and I'll come back to that in a little bit more a little bit more detail in a moment. 
Um, the mathematical and scientific uncertainty is where we might traditionally think about quantifying uncertainty in this space is around the model structures, the actual equations that we're putting into these modeling frameworks to predict bushfire. Um, the numbers, the parameters that we put into those equations, the inputs and the data that we use to train those equations and give us an answer. All of those different components come with, with layers of uncertainty that may be extrinsic or intrinsic to the particular processes that we're trying to capture. And over the last um, 20 years or so, there's been a huge amount of progress in the fire modelling um, world to improve our understanding of uncertainty, particularly in the, these particular aspects of our modelling system. And so we've gone from a, a position where we would deterministically predict fire. So we would say there is a fixed wind speed, there's a fixed temperature, there's a fixed fuel load, and we get a fixed, um, uh, a fixed fire rate of spread um, of the fire coming out of it and a fixed prediction of where our fire would be. And so we've gone from that to actually thinking about, well, these inputs, these models, the parameters all have levels of uncertainty around them. Rather than having a single wind speed, there's actually a whole distribution of possible wind speeds around what that might be. And we need to account for the variability in that. And so what that results in is a um, is um, the, some variability in our predictions of wind on fire behavior and our variability of predictions around fire perimeters, for example. And so over the last 10, 10 years or so, there's been a development of a huge number of tools that are really state of the art globally um, in terms of incorporating uncertainty, particularly from this mathematical and scientific concept into the prediction of fires um, and fire perimeters in real time. And so most recently, we've seen um, the release and development of Spark um, from CSRO, which is actually our first nationally consistent prediction technology um, for um, bushfire behaviours and bushfire spread. And so I, I focus on nationally consistent there because another source of uncertainty within this in the past has been that fire spread in different ways in under different um, different areas of uh, across Australia. There's very different landscapes, but they're also responded to in different ways due to different jurisdictions and, and different understandings um, across different states and so on. Um, and so by bringing all of that into a nationally consistent framework, we are um, reducing the uncertainty around the variability in those kind of components. Um, so, yeah, so we've improved our understanding of uncertainty around fire prediction um, over the last 10 years or so, and we've developed these really state-of-the-art tools to be able to visualise and communicate um, uncertainty in the outputs. And so this is where the, the kind of uncertainty and dealing with uncertainty in model structures, parameters and so on builds into dealing with uncertainty in our outputs and communication. It kind of forces our hand in terms of being able to communicate the uncertainty in our predictions. And some of you um, perhaps might recall in 2020, there were these new um, fire prediction maps from New South Wales Rural um, Fire Service that actually gave a prediction of the likelihood of um, a where the fire was going to spread over the next hour or two hours or day or so on, and the likely um, impacts of spotting in those areas. Um, and so this is where we start to see that crossover of, of communicating uncertainty across different layers of decision making. So we go from not just dealing with uncertainty in in the sci on the scientific side within a, within the scientific community, we communicated and progressed that to the kind of decision making amongst um, our fire managers, the politicians, and so on. Um, and now we're looking at communicating that to the public and educating the public around understanding and, and uncertainty in, in the decisions that then we need to make. All right. So now I want to come back to um, briefly this idea of thinking about um, the uncertainty in the model design, in the model paradigm. And so as we progress, um, or as we, we see a world that is more and more influenced through by things like climate change, um, we start, we've started to see and witness fire behaviours in particular um, that are very, very different um, from what we would imagine, what we are able to predict under our traditional um, modelling paradigm. 
Um, and this starts, uh, this, and particularly, like I said, and we've started in 2003, we started to witness a few little different things. And then in 2019, 2020, and many of you may have seen multiple um, news reports over the last few years of this idea of firestorms, fire tornadoes, um, pyrocumulonimbus, which is where essentially your fire creates its own thunderstorm, which creates all sorts of new and complicated and difficult conditions. Um, and so we're starting to see an almost step change in how our fires behave. And this is where these kind of frameworks of understanding uncertainty allow us to see that we cannot cope with this level, this, um, in, this introduction of uncertainty when we're thinking about our models in the same paradigms that we have been thinking about them. And so um, a huge amount of work has been done at UNSW Canberra, where I did my PhD um, on this area, and they have produced a video that um, explains some of this in a far better and well-produced um, way than I have, can possibly. Um, so I'm just going to play you a short clip of that um, now. So just give me a moment. Our current predictive models are based on a small, well-defined line of fire that grows with a roughly constant speed. The reality of firestorms is much more complicated. As fires grow, critical changes in the landscape and weather conditions can cause a relatively benign fire to suddenly escalate. Flying embers lead to localised spot fires which can coalesce, forming new blazes and multiple fire fronts. The behaviour of the fire is now very difficult to predict. Let me just get back to here. Okay, so, so as you can see, um, we've got these new, they're not necessarily new behaviours, but they're increasingly new um, observed behaviours that change the paradigm under which we are modelling fire behaviour. Um, and ultimately, we need to rethink all of the assumptions, all of the structures that we've put into these fire modelling frameworks to better capture these kind of extreme fire behaviours. But the good news is that lots and lots of that work is being done and has been done in the last 15 years or so to think about um, how we can better capture these um, concepts in our fire modelling um, systems and incorporate those in better ways. Um, but at least, yeah. And so in kind of summary to this, this bushfire part of the talk um, is, is that predicting these bushfires involve a really complex involved modelling um, systems with multiple layers of compounding uncertainty in, in, in there. And there's been a shift in these modelling paradigms in particular over the last 20 years that in a lot of ways have been driven by an increasing number of catastrophic events that we have seen in this in this area um, and, and by part of the influence of climate change within that. And so we've been driving towards, we kind of been, our hand has been forced in many ways um, to increase our understanding of uncertainty and the variability in bushfire behaviour as we see more of these extreme fire behaviours. Um, and so much work has been done um, to identify the behaviours that we can see, um, to, to identify the uncertainty in that process using frameworks such as what I've talked about today, um, to understand, break down and then communicate, account for and communicate the uncertainty in our decision making. Now, in the last part um, of, or the second part, but very short part of um, my talk, I want to kind of switch gears to forecasting wind energy. And this might seem quite different to what I've just talked about, but actually they're very much integrated. And I want to use this as an example of how we can use that in uncertainty framework to, to interrogate the uncertainty of a system and think about how we can reduce the uncertainty from a particular source or a particular um, concept. And so this problem, again, comes back to the idea of tackling global challenges of climate change. Integrating renewables in national electricity grids is a task that is well underway across the globe. Um, and, a, and a key question within that is about stabilising or addressing the inherent variability in some renewable resources such as in wind power, for example. And we can have lots of long, um, in-depth discussions about using, um, stabilising these kind of resources, using storage solutions and so on. And we can talk about that from many different aspects. 
Um, but what I want to look at today is thinking about improving the predictability of wind. And so we're kind of accounting for that variability in our predictions of wind generation. And these ideas, stabilizing with storages and improving predictability are very much interlinked and about addressing the inherent uncertainty in some of these renewable resources. And so um, let's think about the, the system that is, how do we predict wind generation, wind energy generation? And so if we start from the right hand side here with our decisions and our outputs, um, what we want to do is have a power output, a power prediction that we can use, that we can trust, um, or trust is not a good word, but uh, that we can rely on um, in order to make decisions in the energy market and so on. And our power output is generally um, produced um, from in a wind energy context, we need to model our wind speed or predict our wind speed, and then we can apply a power curve to get a, um, a predicted power generation. And so the plot on the right here with the green bar is our manufacturer's power curve. For every turbine that is produced, um, there is a theoretical um, deterministic um, physically based um, power curve that translates wind speed to power output for that power curve. And that's based on some very mechanical, physical processes. And as you can see, that curve allows for no uncertainty around that. In reality, what we might see is when we observe wind speed against observe, um, observed um, power output is something more like the middle um, plot there, where we see a lot of variation around the, the winds that we, the wind and the power relationship. And much of that variation comes back to um, the variation that we might see in a in a predicted wind speed. And so the plot on the left there is predicted wind speed versus um, observed wind speed. And we can see there's a lot of spread there. So we can kind of track back the uncert some of the uncertainty in this system to the modeling of the wind um, at our hub height, at our turbine. And so modeling the wind at, the tur at a turbine can have multiple different aspects to it. Um, what we often use in order to forecast forward is a, say, a numerical weather prediction system, which is based on a whole lot of very complicated atmospheric physics um, that will predict wind over generally a pretty large area. So at best over a one kilometre space, at worst, you know, at worst, at larger scale, up to kind of 40 kilometres or so. And even within that system, there are then uncertainties around what kind of processes we're capturing within those, um, those numerical weather prediction systems and so on. And so we can kind of trace back through our, our process that is predicting power to think about where the uncertainties lie in all of these different components. And I want to think about one particular component today, which is um, some of the uncertainties that lie right back in those numerical weather prediction systems. And so one such, uh, one such kind of um, beha wind behavior or wind phenomenon that occurs um, and that might be captured in these systems is something called a low level jet. It's a nocturnal boundary layer phenomenon. And basically what happens with a low level jet is this is our wind speed profile above the ground during a jet. And what we get are these massive bulges in wind speed. And so the reason these are relevant and shown to be relevant to um, wind power production is that we get this bulge in wind speed at heights that are around um, the hub height of a turbine. When And this is during periods when we might expect reasonably low wind speeds. These phenomena suddenly occur um, and we get this real spike in wind speed going on when we might not expect it. And so if we can predict these, if we know that we can predict these, then we know that we can um, rely on um, there being a higher wind speed or higher power output eventually during that period. The problem with this particular phenomena is that it's very, it's not very well understood. It's not very well characterized, particularly in Australia. And so there have been some global studies um, that have identified hotspots, such as in this map here, of these kind of processes across um, Australia. But these these particular models, these reanalyses models, are based on a kind of 40 kilometer grid. And so how can we know for sure if a process that is modeled over a 40 kilometer grid is actually occurring and, and, um, and felt at that hub height level, which might be 80 meters above the ground in a kind of couple of meters radius. 
But what I want to talk about in terms of the context of our uncertainty framework here is at least with these these broad, um, at least with these kind of broad studies and work from elsewhere in the world, we've moved from a level of uncertainty of a complete unknown unknown to something that is now a known unknown. So we're moving our way up that level of uncertainty. And what we can do in, in a particular study that we worked on over the last 12 months is identify whether or not these, these phenomena are seen at the surface. Um, I'm just check the time. Yeah. Um, and so we can see um, this top left plot here is showing a low level jet in these orange areas and it's identified at these crosses here and we can so we can observe these low level jets at these lower um, these um, high resolution um, instruments we can observe that these low level jets are happening and in fact the plot at the bottom there shows us that we can see very often peaks in power when these jets occur um, and we can quantify that with these small studies to show that actually they, these jets account for 1% of power production over a year. And so that might seem pretty insignificant, but by the time we've dealt with these broad ideas of the wind speed and so on, what we're trying to improve in terms of uncertainty are these 1% around the edges. And so these kind of studies move our uncertainty around this process from an acknowledgement from a known unknown through to perhaps these kind of scenarios. We have an idea of the kind of magnitude of um, uncertainty that these things incorporate. And lastly, um, the aim would be therefore to move this further up to the statistical level. And so this is another example of a jet which we can actually see in far smaller scale models um, such as the Axis C model, which is a 1.5 kilometer um, resolution and the yellow that we can see in these maps here is are those modeled jets um, impacting the wind farm as we see um, those, these jets observed in the observation in the observations and so with more work in this kind of area we can move our uncertainty around this process from a scenario um, quantification up to um, up to a, a statistical level and we can reduce that uncertainty around that or characterize the uncertainty around that and so that was a kind of brief um, example of how we can use these frameworks to really narrow down on um, our ideas of uncertainty in these in these really complicated um, processes. And so we're integrating renewables um, across the globe, um, but there are, of course, these uncertainties associated with it. But fortunately, we are armed with many, many tools and most of the tools that we need to in order to address these uncertainties. And we can use these generalized frameworks to really narrow down um, where those uncertainties lie and how we can address them. And so my um, final point today um, is about communicating this uncertainty. It is all very well dealing with the uncertainty within the modeling process, dealing with the uncertainty as scientists, but as we talked about in the fire context, we need to be able to communicate that uncertainty and provide the information behind decision-making to all levels um, of decision-maker. And in many areas, there is still some significant cultural shifts that are needed in that space. As human beings, we like to know what a yes or a no answer is. Please tell us, particularly when we're at population, at population level, tell us one answer and one answer only. Um, and so there needs to be this integrated education around what uncertainty means um, and how we can make clear and objective decisions under uncertainty. And ultimately, uncertainty is all around us. We make decisions under uncertainty every single day um, of varying levels of consequence. Um, and in order to address some of our global challenges that we uh, um, need to deal with today, we need to be able to characterise this uncertainty and communicate that uncertainty um, to enable these informed decisions and mitigate some of the risks involved. So really the lesson from today, um, I hope, is that uncertainty shouldn't be something that we shy, shy away from. It certainly shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't be something that prevents us from progressing. Um, it, it should be something that we, we need to acknowledge, we need to own it, um, and we need to understand um, what, where it comes from in order to ask the next questions, if you like. And so um, on that theme, I will leave you with one final um, Game of Thrones meme. Um, in that at least if we don't know it, let's at least acknowledge that we don't know. All right. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much, Rachel. Um
fascinating and really interesting. And I have a lot of opinions on the things you're talking about, but this isn't about me answering stuff. We do have some questions on, um, on the question and answer. So I'll just go through them with you. Um, so the first one, which was anonymous attendee sort of halfway through, posted a question asking, does human behavior play a role in the increasing, un in increasing uncertainty in the spread of the fire? Um, um, yes, there are there there are definitely human elements to um, the uncertainty around fire um, prediction and fire management in particular. Um, one such element is is around there is a significant increase in what is called the wild what is it wildland urban interface W. UI. Um, so essentially, humans are interacting and are living closer to nature. And so um, the uncertainties around how to manage a fire um, uh, increased by um, the fact that there is simply more human interaction around that fire. There are more humans and, and property um, in, in order to protect. There are more people to, to move. There are more people making decisions and individual decisions as well as collective decisions um, around how to, how to deal with that threat, if you like. And so, yes, definitely um, there are human um, influences on the increasing uncertainty around fire. Um, around the fire behavior um, side of things, um, there was obviously a lot of debates that I think many have been debunked around um, the influences of things like um, the influences of things like arson and um, 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 uh, fuel reduction burning and things like that, those kind of human influences. I think many of the discussions, the controversial discussions that were had around that in the 2019, 2020, um, after the 2020 season, um, many of that has been has been debunked um, in a lot of different places. It was all a bit controversial, um, but but there are definitely human um, decisions that are made that in, that increase um, that do increase uncertainty. We are all um, we all have to make the decisions at the end of the day, like I said, um, and that contributes a huge amount of uncertainty to to that entire process. Um, but like I said, the idea is if we can incorporate an education around it. Um, around uncertainty and making those decisions, then hopefully we can all at least be making informed decisions in that space. Okay. We had another question from Usha who said, how, who asked, how much of this is understood and adapted by politicians? Um, Usha did say in helping communities in a transparent way, but maybe we should just leave it, how much of it is understood and adapted by politicians? Oh well, um, I I haven't spoken to any politicians personally, um, so I'm not sure I can answer that. Um, I I do, um, as I said right at the beginning, um, in the in the kind of COVID space, um, there there appears to be a, a have been a significant change in the last twelve to eighteen months around, at least. Um, needing to make decisions based on on evidence and understanding the uncertainty around that evidence. Um, wh how well it's understood, I suppose, is a different matter. Um, from a from a fire um, management perspective, the fire managers as opposed to the politicians, so the politicians are, are pretty hands off when it comes to the fire management kind of operations on the day, real time. Um, the fire operations, it's very well understood the uncertainty within that process and the decisions that are made around, you know, evacuations and, and resp fire response and things. Um, of, it's all very well understood in terms of those managers that are actively on the ground. It is an area where the integration, that kind of integration of communication and education is really solid. Um, um, but yeah, um, from the politician's perspective, uh, you'll have to ask a politician. Yeah, and if we translate it, for example, to COVID management, there'll be lots of different opinions, I would have thought. Uh, yeah. Let's move on. Um, we got a question from Louise Ryan, who, who uh, congratulates you, um, Rachel, for a fantastic presentation. She's got a question about the known, unknown, 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 et cetera, terminology, which yeah. Louise points out is uh, infamously was infamously introduced by Donald Rumsfeld, mm -hmm. um, but she's pointing out that those terms are quite informal. And yeah. are there alternative descriptors that get the ideas across in the same way? Um, so, so um, 
I um yes yeah, so the known unknowns and, and I, I, they, they were the informal kind of descriptors the, the the more formal descriptors were the kind of the idea of um ignorance which has been which has been published um but people don't tend to like being called ignorant um but um yeah the idea of ignorance of, of not knowing those things it's a very difficult concept to kind of tangibly hold on to because as soon as you acknowledge it then then it's gone <laughs> so anyway um and yeah so i wouldn't use the known unknowns um necessarily in a in a technical um sense um the the ignorance through to um i can't even remember what they are now they're kind of um statistical scenario based um through to um deterministic in terms of having a complete known known and that would be your deterministic uncertainty which isn't actually uncertainty i suppose in terms of the practical sense but um yeah some of the other terms that i had on the slides were the more technical i suppose um but there are a variety of different things out there in the literature yeah so we've got a, a few questions mainly goes to the modeling i'll try and collect them together stephen spencer asked how much of the uncertainty in wind power modeling is due to uh, cfd which is computational fluid dynamics turbulence modeling limitations um and Chris Medlin mentions Phoenix Rapid Fire, which I believe is Colin mm -hmm. Colhurst's software. For um, he's mentioned yep. that it's modeled by certain Win Ninja software. Yep. We'd like to see improvements in the modeling understanding. So I guess these are questions about the details of the modeling. What do you think about that, Rachel? Yeah. So um, in the wind energy. Um, space there are yeah like I said there's lots of um, systems there are that are contributing to the uncertainty in those spaces and and dealing with the uncertainty around turbulence and and the wake of turbines and so on and how you design your wind farm in particular so that you get um, the optimal kind of um, design and structure of how you're going to capture the wind speeds in that space um, uh, yeah, there are some pretty significant um, uncertainties involved in those kind of modelling. Um, I don't have numbers and figures on hand for that, um, but the in there is there is movement. I suppose the kind of lessons of what I'm talking about today is actually the movement towards recognising that those uncertainties exist um, and actually incorporating them into a communication. So I think in the bushfire context, there's um, a lot better understanding and pulling that right through the system. Um, in the wind energy context, it's quite constrained still by requiring an individual value of prediction for an energy market, for example. There's not much space around that. And this is why I talk about these cultural shifts in understanding uncertainty. Um, there's, there's very little um, 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 kind of leeway on a prediction in an energy market that is based upon very deterministic systems and has been historically. Um, and so that's a kind of shift that needs to happen. In the in the bushfire space, um, yes, someone mentioned Phoenix Rapid Fire. Um, that is essentially, um, that's the system that has been very traditionally, very successfully used for a long time. But when we talk about moving to these extreme paradigms, it's not capable of capturing um, these kind of behaviors because as that little video um, said, it, the way that it's been trained and developed over the past kind of almost um, like half a century or 70 years or so now, um, as in the models underpinning Phoenix, not Phoenix itself, but um, the way that it's trained and developed um, it's 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 in that kind of traditional paradigm which works in many scenarios but in these kind of more extreme fires as we see these step changes um there is a significant paradigm shift and there is a lot of work being done to kind of redevelop um fire models in that space um rather than kind of tweaking the edges of the existing so we've got also a bunch of questions which i'd sort of group under the heading of translating what you see from the model into decisions in political context so an anonymous attendee says how do we feel about public pressure when a decision under certainty turns out to be wrong i would yeah. that that's not clear what it means for a decision under uncertainty to be wrong um yeah you know you can make the right decision and just be unlucky and get a bad outcome but that doesn't mean it was the wrong decision um yeah. someone else has asked how to bring uncertainty in the way policy is formulated um mm. 
Someone else, Melanie uh, Roberts, has asked about availability of methods to identify and manage thresholds for uncertainty where decisions would change. So it's all about, you know, modelling leading to decision making and leading to the political process, I guess, which requires, you know, communication with the general public. So have you got any comments on all that, uh, Rachel? Yeah, um, I think, um, I think, yeah, this comes back to some of my comments at the end about kind of integrating the development, the kind of model development and understanding of uncertainty within the decision making process, but also integrating the decision making process into the kind of development of the of modeling and addressing uncertainty in the modeling. Um, because, you know, ultimately, well, let's think about the, the fire context, for example. Um, ultimately a decision uh, needs still needs to be made as to whether or not you evacuate i remember talking to a, a, a fire operations manager at some point being like well i'm still the one that has to say yes or no to evacuating that town right um and so that there needs to be communication and work in order to ensure that you are maintaining that perspective as you're addressing the various uncertainties within your modeling process um and dealing with um how you improve the information available you have to be conscious of actually what information would make this decision um a more informed decision um and and like i said being very conscious of you're not we're not trying to necessarily change the decision this is you know an ob objective science at the end of the day you're not trying to change the decision or even say if the decision is right or wrong you're just simply trying to improve the amount of information um, and the way that it's packaged, I think improving the amount of information, but it just being more sporadic information is just more confusing for people. Um, we need to be conscious of how we communicate and package that. And um, and improving kind of statistical literacy, and this is where I, I say, yes, there may have been multiple flaws in the past 18 months or so, but actually to see graphs and exponential growth explained on the television on an almost daily basis as a statistician has been well actually perhaps the statistical literacy of the public has improved to an extent that you know we can start we can have these conversations like individual people are not are not stupid we can we can communicate and we need to be able to um we don't need, we don't want to be gatekeepers of this information but we need to make sure that it's communicated in a way that that yeah we don't end up with more more ill-informed decisions and we need more informed decisions be conscious of okay that. thanks we've got a it's one o'clock so if anyone has to go then um please feel free to do so but there's a couple of final questions that i might just put to you rachel one is from H. Bender, who, who pointed out that you've argued we can reduce uncertainty by moving unknown unknowns up the uncertainty level scale. But uh, that person asks, how do you see the process of identifying unknown unknowns? Mm. I suppose that is um, one of the biggest um, steps required. Um, and essentially, I think until now, it's um, I'm not sure if there is a systematic way in which we can do that. Um, but I think in terms of trying to break down your process and actually holistically looking at it rather than and, um, and, and thinking about all of those components that we talked about within this kind of framework um, enables you to break down a process and go, well, actually, I haven't thought about it from that context before. And maybe there is an unknown there that we need to address and we can look at. Um, in terms of the kind of fire and wind modeling examples that I've shown, essentially it comes from, you know, you've observed something that is different and new and trying to think about how that fits into your current system and maybe it doesn't. And so we've got to address that elsewhere. And so that becomes from an unknown to, to a known. Um, so yeah, there are kind of multiple, um, you, can, you can sit there and, and think, think more about the problem um, and break it down in a more holistic way um, or or in fact you know critically assessing the observations and being being brave enough to think outside the box and assume that it perhaps doesn't fit in what we have known before I think okay and one final one from Isha who points out that it's often the case that weather cannot be determined more than a week in advance could something similar be said about wildfires Uh, yes, I think I think very very much so. Um, there, um, 
Uh, a lot of, uh, well, for, for starters, a lot of the processes involved are very similar kind of physical processes in terms of the dependence on the weather itself, for example. Um, but yes, there are, um, you know, the accumulation of errors in those kind of processes get so large over a certain kind of forecasting ahead horizon that they do, you know, they inevitably will become uncertain. Um, uh, too uncertain to predict over a certain period of, over a period of time. Um, so yeah, there, there's always caution in in looking too far ahead um, with these things. Um, under you know with with the limitations of the tools that you're using in mind, of course. Okay. And I've just noticed one last question, which has been posted by Claire Sanford, which I think is a good place to finish. Who's pointed out that a song of ice and fire takes place in a fictional world in which seasons last for years on end and, and end unpredictably? So that's yeah. probably a, a good way yeah. to notice that, um, yeah. Yes. So Rachel, I found it really interesting. Um, I can talk about these things uh, for a long time. I, I do think the interface of science in particular science involving uncertainty which pretty much i would argue any science does um and political decision making is something that in face needs to be worked on by society in a lot of ways because i think there's not always good communication and not always good understanding and it's part of our job those people like you know asem we pretty well everyone in asem's works and in some type of mathematical modeling that involves uncertainty and um, we shouldn't be afraid to get involved in the political process because you have to do that if you want, um, want the, the output of what you think about um, to be used. And I think you've given a really good um, idea of how that works in one particular area, um, in, the, in weather and bushfire modeling, um, Rachel, and it, it's been a, a really, really interesting and informative talk. So on behalf of everyone, like to thank you um, consider yourself to have a massive amount of loud applause which probably across on zoom but it was a really good talk so thanks very much thank you peter and thank you everyone